So next I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Dwarak Nathan. He's going to talk to you today about um, minimally invasive mitral pr uh, procedures. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk, this is hopefully going to be light on a lot of technical details relative to what Dr. Rule just presented to you. Uh, my hope is to give you a little bit of the perioperative, perioperative medicine and anesthesiologist perspective on these minimally invasive operations. Uh, next slide, please. Or do I get to do it up here? Aha, I don't have any disclosures to give you. Uh, that being said, I'm always looking to develop a side hustle. So if one of you has an idea for how I can make a little extra money on the side and work less in the operating room, I'm always open. Yep. <laughs> uh, what this is not about, uh, tavers and mitral clips. That's going to be very well covered elsewhere during this program, I imagine. A uh, little background in history. Um, minimally invasive operations, what are we talking about here? We're talking about something other than what we would consider to be the gold standard of uh, cardiac surgery, which was the median sternotomy developed at the dawn and outset of uh, cardiac surgery. The um, nice thing about the sternotomy, as Dr. Rill probably pointed out, it's maximally invasive. You see everything in theory. And for years, this is how we did it, right? Um, at the dawn of the uh, cardiac surgery era, benefit to the patient, right? That the faster we can get them on pump, the faster we can complete the operation, the faster we can finish the operation and get them off pump and close them up, the better the patient is likely to do. However, this may not really be the case anymore. Anesthetic techniques, perioperative medical management of these patients, intraoperative, intraoperative techniques. All these things have uh, improved patient outcomes, allowed them to tolerate the pump runs and the insult to the body uh, much more uh, effectively than in years past. So really the question has to come up. Do we have to continue to do median sternotomy for every single operation? I submit to you the answer is no. So minimally invasive approaches. Uh, first described in New Delhi, India by Rao and Kumar, uh, they described two patients done uh, via a right thoracotomy incision, uh, aortic valve replacements. This was in 1993. Uh, followed on closely from developments in the laparoscopic world. Uh, I think they got the idea uh, after uh, evolution of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomies. Uh, this was followed in um, 96 at the Cleveland Clinic in a report by uh, Cosgrove et al., uh, in which they detail much the same or mini sternotomy approaches uh, to replacement of the aortic valve. Uh, Cohen et al. at the Brigham and Women's in 1997 uh, described a case series of 50 patients, uh, minimally invasive, uh, both via median sternotomy, excuse me, a median mini sternotomy, as well as a right uh, thoracotomy approach. I think one of the things that took me a little while to grasp um, was that mini, minimally invasive surgery is not a procedure. Perhaps Dr. Rule touched on this earlier, but there, it's a, rather a, an approach to doing the surgery. Uh, we are talking about multiple approaches, these being the two most common, mini hemisternotomy as well as a right anterior thoracotomy. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and I don't know how well this projects. On the right up here, you can see a median, and, a median sternotomy. On the left, you can see a right anterior thoracotomy and the relative size reduction in the incision, uh, as well as avoidance of some of the key structures, vascular structures, right in the midline. The surgeons that I'm told, I'm told the surgeons find the right anterior thoracotomy approach to be more anatomic, that the valve lies in a plane that is uh, more uh, in line with what you would expect to see. That being said, it is a deeper approach. So from a technical aspect, the entire surgery and the surgical exposure has to be altered in order to accomplish the uh, repair. However, I would point out, this is nothing more than just valvular surgery. It is still a surgical repair, the gold standard for any of this. I don't know why my notes aren't translating over. And a anterior thoracotomy incision, clearly uh, a small. This one's about that long. And this was a mitral valve repair. Uh, some other studies. The problem in getting this to be widely uh, adopted, I think, is, is multifold. We're talking about an operation that a lot of people don't know about, whose benefit, although suggested at in many of these papers, hasn't conclusively been demonstrated, certainly in durability of the repairs, certainly in total outcomes. However, 
Apologies, everyone. Uh, however, there are definitely some downsides. Most of the literature, uh, when you're talking about peripheral cannulation for these uh, procedures, higher reported incidence of strokes, surgeries do tend to be a little bit longer. There are equipment costs, new equipment, new retractors. If you're using a robot approach, then you have to deal with the robot as well, startup costs. And I would argue that the surgical training for all of this is only uh, recently starting to um, become wide, uh, widely done. However, as the regulators and the payers are starting to look at these so-called markers of quality, and I'll put that in quotes, um, could minimally invasive operations be a holy grail of, of cheap patient satisfaction? Certainly Cohen et al., they talk about this, that the patients are getting out more quickly. They are getting out of the hospital, I mean, more quickly. They're spending less time in the ICU, shorter ventilation times, less blood usage, smaller incisions, less pain afterwards. There's a lot of good reasons why we might want to do this. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Bear with me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to find my notes here. Uh, future of the approach. Now, why is it important that we, those of us who primarily live in an operating room, why is it that we have to worry about this? Well, this may in fact be the future. Cardiac surgeons, Ross, you can probably comment on it you are facing an increased competition from percutaneous approaches. And depending on the political environment and where you're at, the surgeons may or may not be involved in all these percutaneous approaches. You have uh, an inability to do concomitant procedures. The TEE is extraordinarily important. If there is an unexpected finding or the, con the diagnosis is not confirmed uh, the way that we expected, our ability to alter what we're doing is somewhat limited based on these minimal approaches. And I think a broader question is, how do we structure the training process for the surgeons uh, in a still evolving field? What do the surgical residents and the surgical fellows do? It's an open question. Consideration for anesthesiologists. I think I've emphasized all of my fellows and residents that we're still doing cardiac surgery. We still have to get the patient somehow. We have to get them on cardiopulmonary bypass. We somehow need to stop the heart. We somehow need to open the heart, accomplish the surgical repair. This may involve us placing special lines. I believe Dr. Rule probably spoke to you about the PA sump, just a PA catheter. There are coronary sinus catheters, which could be placed. There are temporary pacing wires, which we've placed under fluoroscopy. Ad adjusting our approach pharmacologically intraoperatively to reduce the length of intubation in the ICU, short-acting neuromuscular blockade, maybe not using pancuronium, for example, if you can even find it anymore. Uh, anything we can do to coordinate, use of dexmedetomidine, for example, propofol, rather than big doses of other long-acting sedatives for ICU stay, and certainly the use of TEE. These are a few of those um, additional catheters I was speaking about. Uh, endoaortic clamp, uh, marker here, guess not. The endoaortic clamp is a means of internally clamping the ascending aorta so that cardioplegia could be delivered. Uh, the endopulmonary vent is what Dr. Rule, I'm sure, spoke about, uh, allowing us to sump the, uh, or decompress the left ventricle while in cardiopulmonary bypass. Endosinus catheter, coronary sinus catheter for the delivery of retrograde cardioplegia. And the venous cannula, which in the right thoracotomy approach is essential to getting adequate venous drainage from the right side of the heart for cardiopulmonary bypass. This is an example of what that looks like if you were to use a multi-stage fenestrated catheter threaded up from the femoral vein into the right atrium. And the tip of it should sit in the superior vena cava, allowing drainage from both above and below. 3D TEE. Um, Although a lot can be seen on 2D, and depending on who your surgeon is, they may be more comfortable looking at it in uh, two dimensions rather than three. But uh, here you may be able to appreciate a, a flail segment. Uh, this was a P2 flail, as I recall. Apologize for the quality of this. I think we were getting some artifact. But uh, this was a repair of the posterior leaflet along with a little bit of a ring, which you should be able to see. Uh, this is a video uh, from Dr. Lamellis, uh, his so-called Miami method. 
uh, illustrating many of the techniques that I spoke about. Femoral cannulation, uh, guided by TEE, confirm uh, positioning of the wire. This is the venous cannula going in via that femoral cut down. Connection uh, facilitates both retrograde um, arterial as well as venous uh, priming, retrograde autologous priming, confirmation of the diagnosis, establishment of the surface landmarks, and that little smiley face there would be the incision. Placement of the soft uh, retractor and then the, uh, the small mini retractor which you'll use to spread the ribs. As Dr. Rule said, there's multiple ways to get your drains, lines, pacing wires in that do not obstruct your view. This is the view of the surgeon looking through down into this hole. I would still point out it's all the same stuff. It's all the same stuff you would do open, just doing it through a different approach. If I had my computer here, I would fast forward a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Aortic clamp going on. This is a gooseneck. It's rigid now, but what you may see here in a moment after he deploys the clamp is he can retract the rigid part and it will actually bend out of the way. Yep, there's a retraction and there it bends out of the way. He uses a 14 gauge angiocatheter to deliver his anterograde cardioplegia. And then we'll later use that to de air. Doing your aortotomy. You can see there that we have a little shelf that he places in. And then from above, as you can see, they're putting in a holder, which percutaneously will retract the uh, shelf to allow exposure. This is actually a mitral, not an aortic, excuse me. This visor just rolls it up like a little tube sock, sticks it in there, and then it just by spring force opens up to provide a nice clear tunnel to the mitral valve. Music would be more dramatic at this time, perhaps. Something classical. I'll overlay next time. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Superb. <laughs> Still standard repairs, though. Resection, sew the pieces together, patches. It's a lot of the same stuff. It's a lot of the same stuff you would do open. Okay, checking to make sure it's pay, uh, competent, rather. Sizing the ring. Looks like a competent repair. Pull out all of our retractors, close the patient up, bring them off pump. It's, uh, it's a nice technique, takes a little while. And um, as I showed you in one of those earlier photographs, you're left with that tiny little incision. I don't have the data yet. I suspect that uh, that'll be being published soon. Um, one of the reasons he came here from Miami um, was I think to get tied into Baylor's publishing apparatus, whatever that means. But um, anecdotally, I would tell you, these patients are getting extubated very quickly. They're spending a very little amount of time in the hospital, and their satisfaction scores are very high once they actually do go home. Mm. 
And that's your incision. Good repair. So this is what can, whoops, darn it, was that it? This is what can be accomplished. And um, one of the challenges that we've had over at St. Luke's is trying to teach this, I think, to our surgeons, our surgery residents. Dr. Lamellis is still uh, figuring some of this stuff out. He's experimenting with different approaches. And um, how do you confer this to the next uh, generation of surgeons, I think, is an open-ended question. Uh, surgeons in the room, I hope you do have an opportunity to practice this. Dr. Rules is good a teacher as you could possibly hope for. I wish you'd come back, Ross, <laughs> more often than you do. Um, for those of you who are with us at St. Luke's, I'd encourage you to pay attention to this. And for those of you who have the opportunity to uh, refer or even think about what patients might be suitable, I would put this to you as an open-ended question. If you were an otherwise healthy young person with, say, a bicuspid valve, like bicuspid aortic valve with uh, evolving um, aortic stenosis or regurgitation, would you in your 30s or 40s want a median sternotomy when you could potentially accomplish the same repair this way? It actually happened to us, a, uh, a former fellow of ours, a couple years out, her husband um, had exactly this. And uh, the, the question that she had was, do we bring him back here to do the aortic valve surgery in his late 30s? Because that's how bad he's going into heart failure and save the median sternotomy for when he actually needs it to replace that aortic valve later in life, maybe along with a coronary bypass graft or a mitral repair as well. Save that primary sternotomy for when it's really needed. Open-ended question, because this is still a evolving uh, methodology. Um, but keep an eye out for it. And um, again, I apologize for the technical difficulties in my late appearance, but uh, thank you very much for your time and attention.